The program of St. Louis Blues, originally scheduled for this time, has been canceled. Representative Maury Maverick of Texas, scheduled at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, will be heard instead at 8.45 p.m. this evening, speaking on the subject, Too Many Battleships and War. Tonight, the world trembles, torn by conflicting forces. Throughout this day, event has crowded upon event in tumultuous Austria. Meanwhile, the outside world, gravely shaken by the Austrian crisis, moves cautiously through a maze of diplomatic perils. Since the German troops crossed the Austrian border on the historic invasion last Friday, news has flowed across the Atlantic in a steady stream. The German Chancellor now winds his way through the conquered nation in a parade of triumph to end in a tremendous spectacle in Vienna. As German troops swarm across frontiers in their first offensive since 1914, momentous decisions are being reached in the capitals outside Germany. And so the world spotlight, for three days fastened upon Austria, is shared tonight by London's tiny Downing Street, by the Quai d'Orsay, whose buildings of state line the Seine River in Paris, by other chancelleries throughout the world. To bring you the picture of Europe tonight, Columbia now presents a special broadcast, which will include pickups direct from London, from Paris, and such other European capitals as, at this late hour abroad, have communication channels available. This is Bob Trout speaking to you from New York, opening Columbia's shortwave transatlantic program to cover the key cities of Europe. But before switching to our first European capital, let us look once again at the latest news bulletins with swift, fresh details of a Europe in turmoil. From the Press Radio Bureau comes a summary written from news supplied by the Associated Press, the United Press, and the International News Service. And here's a quick glimpse of the critical situation in Central Europe. Right at this moment, Austria is no longer a nation, but is now officially a part of the German Empire. Austria and Germany are being welded together under one command, one army, one policy, one economic compact. The Nazis are driving with all their might to bring Austria under complete Nazi domination. President Miklas has been forced out. Ex-Chancellor Schuschnigg has fled to Hungary. Jews, Catholic leaders, and former Austrian government officials are being jailed. Hitler, protected by a bodyguard of nearly 4,000 troops and police, is preparing tonight to go from Linz to Salzburg and from there to Vienna on a roundabout triumphal tour of the land of his birth, a land which he's fast placing under his thumb. Italy has apparently given Germany an okay, and Hitler has almost fervently thanked Mussolini. In Berlin, Field Marshal Hermann Goering has served notice that Germany intends to go after the Germans in Czechoslovakia, already ringed on several sides by German troops. Czechoslovakia has protested to Germany. It claims that German planes have flown over Czech boundaries, and so Germany promises an investigation. Czechoslovakian diplomatic circles argue that Czechoslovakia is going to be a much tougher nut to crack than Austria was. Their attitude, of course, reinforced by the very strong position which France is taking tonight. France has a new cabinet. Its governmental crisis ended, and it seems to be moving at full speed to bolster up the Czechs and to tighten its alliances with Russia, and from all indications, Russia is willing. In addition to diplomatic steps, Motorized columns of French troops are now pushing eastward from the general vicinity of Nancy, at which point France has its strongest eastern concentration of military strength. Infantrymen, machine gunners, and artillery units are included in this movement, and as French officials are closely guarding the scope and details of the movements, this may be of great significance. In London, across the Channel, Prime Minister Chamberlain and his new Foreign Secretary, Viscount Halifax, put their heads together in a conference over Hitler's formal announcement absorbing Austria into the German Reich. They have debated whether they're going to join France in a very stern course of action, and it looks as though they are prepared to go a very long way. Mr. Chamberlain will tell the House of Commons about his plans tomorrow morning, and his message is now being drawn up. However, there's a great deal of excitement in London, which today witnessed one of the wildest demonstrations in years. Tonight, more than 25,000 angry laborites and a few communists fought hand-to-hand -hand with reserves of mounted and foot police outside the White Stone German Embassy in London, and they shouted, Hitler is driving Europe to war. The demonstrators were permitted to deliver a manifesto of protest at the door of the German Embassy, and the demonstration then swirled in orderly fashion past the Czechoslovakian legation, and now the shouts became, Austria and Czechoslovakia must be saved. The Hitlers and the Chamberlains must go. 
Some of the crowd went to the Austrian embassy, arriving there just in time to boo the hoisting of the Nazi swastika flag over the former Austrian legation. Unofficially, many Italian sources say that Mussolini is pretty concerned about the shape of events and more concerned about the shape of things to come. However, the Italian official position is hands-off, this despite the fact that German troops are at the historic Brenner Pass. In Austria, Adolf Hitler has had a triumphant day, a day, however, in which he has been closely guarded and is being closely guarded right now at this moment as the Nazification of Austria goes on. In Styria province, the original Nazi hotbed Catholics are in terror. The Nazis claim that they have discovered a hidden store of arms in a monastery. Elsewhere in Austria, there is excitement and turmoil. In order to get a clear idea of just what has been happening, the Associated Press says that you have to visualize what happened in every city, town, and hamlet of the United States in 1918 on Armistice Day. Masses of shouting, singing, flag-waving Viennese milled around, marched through the streets saluting and yelling the Nazi call, Hail Victory! Truckloads of men, women, and children, there were even mothers with babies in their arms, rode through the streets setting up a terrific racket. It seemed as if the whole population was in the streets. Significant of a new order of things, a revolution in the customs and life of the people, as well as in the political and economic aspects, was the switch of coffee house music from the old graceful Viennese waltzes to new German brisk martial airs. There's not much opposition, at least outwardly, to the Nazi drive, but inwardly, no one knows just how a good many of the Austrian people feel because it must be remembered that Austria is overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, that there'd been a very large socialist vote in the last election. In a copyright dispatch, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency says tonight that at least 150 prominent Jews, bankers, and businessmen have been arrested by Nazi brown shirts acting as auxiliary police. The cry of anti-Semitism is being taken up in the Austrian streets. Anti-Jewish measures have already been promulgated. The Austrian press is under Nazi domination. The Nazis have taken over the radio, and they are out to control everything. That last-minute summary of the European situation was furnished by the Press Radio Bureau. And now Columbia begins its radio tour of Europe's capital cities with a transoceanic pickup from London, where we are to hear Ellen C. Wilkinson, woman labor member of the House of Commons. We take you now to London, England. While Hitler continued, or you might say, completed his triumphal conquest of Austria today, Great Britain remained relatively calm. Here in London, there were some anti-German demonstrations this afternoon, a few clashes with the police, but nothing at all serious compared to what I saw in Vienna Friday and yesterday. What happened was this. The International Peace Campaign organized a big meeting in Trafalgar Square. It was at this meeting that Professor Haldane was quoted as having said that criminals were running the British government. There were boos and hisses at the mention of the name of the Prime Minister. When the meeting broke up, most of the crowd, numbering several thousands, and giving the clenched fist salute, marched on the German embassy in Carlton House Terrace, not far away. Mounted and foot police, however, blocked the way at a respectable distance and stopped the crowd. Finally, after much discussion, three persons were permitted by the police to present a letter of protest to the German embassy. I must say that after the delirious mobs I saw in Vienna on Friday night, today's demonstrations here in London looked pretty tame. From the German embassy, the demonstrators made their way to the Czech legation, where they yelled, Save Austria, save Czechoslovakia. The first, of course, is too late. But the second, about saving Czechoslovakia, undoubtedly was the main preoccupation of Prime Minister Chamberlain and his Foreign Minister Lord Halifax today. Mr. Chamberlain returned from Checkers late in the afternoon, just before demonstrators tried to force their way into Downing Street. A cordon was quickly thrown across the street. Tonight, Lord Halifax saw Mr. Chamberlain, and they talked for about a half an hour. Throughout the day, of course, both had been receiving reports from Austria and the rest of Central Europe. Tomorrow, these will be supplemented by a personal report of the British minister in Vienna, who was today called back to London for a personal consultation. Tomorrow morning, there will be a full cabinet meeting and in the afternoon, the government will make statements on the crisis in both houses of parliament. About Czechoslovakia, in circles usually well-informed, they were saying tonight 
that Paris and London might agree to save Czechoslovakia after all. The formula, according to this source, was that France would make a declaration about Czechoslovakia and Great Britain would make a declaration about France. But the meaning would be that both countries agreed to help Czechoslovakia if attacked. Many here, of course, are skeptical as to whether Great Britain would go so far. Now, here is Miss Ellen Wilkinson, who needs no introduction to American listeners, and she is going to tell you what, in her opinion, Britain thinks about the matter and what Britain will do. The luckiest Englishman tonight is Anthony Eden. He got out of the government in town. The attitude of Italy in the Austrian crisis has reinforced dramatically the warning he gave us in his resignation speech to the House of Commons. Everyone will meet about London tonight, whatever their political opinions, is saying, I wouldn't like to be Mr. Chamberlain, having to meet the Commons tomorrow afternoon. You will be asking in America, why doesn't Britain do something? Why this strange paralysis in British politics? Well, first, no one in Britain wants war. At the great protest meeting in Trafalgar Square this afternoon, a speaker asked who will be pacifist in the coming war. A voice in the crowd promptly answered the men who fought in the last war. That voice represented the man in the street. Yet in the same meeting, the demonstrators were shouting, hands off Czechoslovakia. It is not that the British are afraid of Hitler and Mussolini. If they have to fight, they will. But there is no war feeling here as yet. That is perhaps because there is a curious division in public opinion here. The traditions of the parties have somehow got mixed. On the one side, the liberals, pacifists, the labor and socialist adherents have been working against war for years. Until Hitler came to power, they were rather pro-German. But liberals and socialists have seen the fascists, the press, and the Britain doesn't want war, but it doesn't want Hitler either. On the other hand, the conservatives, who in principle have tended to glorify the tradition of arms, have a certain sympathy with those who have suppressed in Germany and Italy much the same sort of people who are the political opponents of conservatism in England. Therefore, the right, for months, have been trying not to see the fascist threat to the British Empire. Then you see, when we meet in Parliament tomorrow, the situation will not seem as clear to us here as it seems to you 6,000 miles away in America. But the idea of playing the game, even if it be a dirty game, according to a set of rules, is strongly ingrained in the English character. When a man rushes in and scoops the pool out of his turn, as Hitler has done in Austria, we English tend to get annoyed. So Mr. Ackley, the leader of the opposition, has been to see Lord Halifax today on the Foreign Secretary's invitation. When he met Mr. Eden resign, Mr. Chamberlain banked his whole future and that of his government on making friends with the dictator. To do this, he had to put the League of Nations and Collective Security in the refrigerator. Today, as I have talked with all kinds of British voters, from agricultural laborers to businessmen, I find that the feeling is rather one of curiosity as to how Mr. Chamberlain will explain the immediate results of his policy tomorrow. But as yet, the feeling, though people here are deeply moved, is mainly one of interested curiosity. All the newspapers today have carried comforting statements that there is no immediate danger of war. Responsible politicians are considering what it is that Britain can really do. I was lunching with Mr. Lloyd George this afternoon. His view was that the fascist expansion might have been stopped in Manchuria or in Abyssinia, easiest of all in Spain, but that the present challenge was the most difficult of all to me. France and Britain touched the frontiers neither of Austria nor Czechoslovakia as their fleets and lands touched both Abyssinia and Spain. As I said, everything is quiet in Vienna tonight. There's a certain air of expectancy about the city, everyone waiting and wondering 
where and at what time Herr Hitler will arrive tomorrow. And we're planning to bring you an eyewitness account of Herr Hitler's entry into Vienna sometime tomorrow. We return you now to America. From Berlin, we have heard Pierre J. Huss, International News Service Berlin correspondent, and then last of all from Vienna, Columbia's European director, Edward R. Merrill, has just spoken to us, which completes Columbia's tour of Europe's troubled capitals. And now in our studios in Washington, D.C., we're to hear now from the Honorable Louis B. Schwellenbach, Democratic senator from the state of Washington. Soon, the increased armaments bill will be argued on the floor of the United States Senate, and as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Schwellenbach has a particular interest in any proposal affecting America's armament. As the United States looks toward Europe tonight, we listen to the opinions of Senator Louis V. Schwellenbach. And for that purpose, we take you now to Washington, D.C. To the average American, the Nazi seizure of Austria demonstrates three things. First, the fertility of contracts or treaties with dictator nations. No one can deny that Friday's invasion was a direct violation of the Berchtigaden Agreement of February 12th. There, Hitler agreed with Schusnick on the independence of Austria. Certainly, no one can deny to an independent state the right to conduct a plebiscite on a question of fundamental policy. Yet Chisnick's announcement of a plebiscite for today resulted in the seizure of Austrian control by Hitler. Second, it demonstrates that treaties signed at the point of a sword are worthless. This climaxes the series of violations of Versailles by Hitler. In no instance have the other signatories to Versailles even more than mildly protested. Third and most important, it demonstrates the futility of war as an instrument for settling international controversies. Twenty years ago, we were in the midst of a gigantic struggle to preserve democracy for the world. We gave our blood, our lives, our money, and our resources. Twenty years later, we see the torch of world leadership being seized by the world's leading dictator. We cannot deny the fact that Adolf Hitler today is Europe's leader. We tremble at what he will do next. We know what will become of religious liberty in Austria, both for the Jews and the Catholics. It just will not exist. We know what will happen to freedom of speech and of the press. They will be suppressed. Democratic processes for seven million Austrians are extinct. The probabilities are that he will press into Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, and then on into the Ukraine. Events are moving rapidly in Europe these days. The old continental intrigue is too fast moving for the average American to understand. England thought that by substituting the realistic actualities of Chamberlain for the idealism of Eden, she could tem stem the tide of the onslaught of the aggressive dictators. Just two weeks later, she found she was too late. Francis thought throughout the years that she could rely upon the steel ring which she had placed about Germany. She now faces its collapse. Even Mussolini looked with patronizing friendliness on his imitator. He now finds that the student has outgrown the master. What does this all add up to so far as America is concerned? Certainly disillusionment as to what can be accomplished by the instrument of war. We tried to preserve democracy in Europe once by going to war. We know now that that method does not work. I have been saddened by the events of these last three days so saddened that I took solace in that source from which I always find comfort when it seems that the going is too rough to stand. I went to the essay of Emerson in which he said, and I quote, This law writes the laws of cities and nations. It will not be balked of its end in the smallest iota. It is in vain to build or plot or combine against it. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. Though no checks to a new evil appear, the checks exist and will appear. Nothing arbitrary, nothing artificial can endure. Of all forms of government yet conceived, democracy furnishes the most useful agencies for fighting arbitrary and artificial mismanagement. What we must do is to protect and preserve democratic methods in America. 
no doubt we will be importuned again to spend our resources in a futile effort to con correct conditions in Europe. The inevitable law of which Emerson speaks will take care of Europe. What we must do is to preserve American democratic processes to care for our own. History shows that demo democracies have disappeared when they fail to care for their own. Futility has ever been the nemesis of democracies. Never in the world's history has it been more necessary for democracy to work than it is for democracy to work here now. That we have an abundance of local problems no one can deny. Quarrels exist between industry and labor and government. This is the time when these quarrels should be submerged for the general good. America's position must be consolidated. If the rest of the world wants to involve itself in a general brawl, that is its business. The permanent advance of civilization depends upon the successful maintenance of democratic institutions somewhere. That place should be here. Let us turn our hand to that task let no outside influences turn us from it. The Honorable Louis B. Schwellenbach, Democratic member of the United States Senate from Washington, who is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has presented America's view of the Austrian crisis. We return you to New York. With world history tense and the greatest crisis in 24 years, the Columbia Network has brought to American citizens a summary of European opinion presented from the capitals of Europe by shortwave radio across the Atlantic Ocean. From London, we heard a member of the House of Parliament, Ellen C. Wilkinson. From Paris, Edgar Maurer, veteran correspondent of the Chicago Daily News. From Berlin, International News Service correspondent, Pierre J. Huss. From Vienna, Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's European director. And finally, to summarize opinion in our own capital city, United States Senator Louis B. Schwellenbach has just finished speaking to you from Washington, D.C. This broadcast from five world capitals has been a presentation of Columbia's Department of Special Events, which will continue to cover the European situation, bringing you special broadcasts and bulletins as fresh news arrives on this side of the ocean. Tonight at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, Columbia presents its regular Sunday night news broadcast, Headlines and Bylines, which tonight will include the latest summaries at that hour. Bob Trout speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.